Evidence of Christian belief in Ireland today has all but vanished. That's according to the Archbishop of Dublin, Dermot Farrell, who outlined his dismay at a major decline in the number of people who actively practice and live their faith, along with a marked drop in vocations to the diocesan priesthood or the religious life. So has the time of devout belief come to an end in this country and is that a positive or a negative thing? I'm joined by David Quinn, columnist with the Sunday Times and the Irish Catholic and Michael Nugent, Chair of Atheist Ireland. Good morning and welcome to you both. Um, David, I'll go to you first of all because uh, the Archbishop painted a a fairly bleak picture of declining vocations, ageing priests and a lack of interest in many of the citizenry in practising the religion to which they nominally are espoused. Well, he's correct about all that. I mean, it's undeniable. Um, I mean, I suppose religion as an organised set of practices and beliefs that people take part in, uh, I mean, that's vanished out of the lives of lots and lots of people. Uh, There's still about, you know, depends on the poll you look at, 25% or 30% of baptised Catholics going to Mass each week, or at least they were before COVID. Um, But if you look at people probably 60 and under, it's far less, and obviously among young people, it's far less again. Um, There was a report actually came out from DCU last week about bullying in schools, and and they discovered that, according to the religion teachers, if you are a kid and you're known to be a practicing Catholic, you can get basically mocked by your classmates. So it's kind of full reversal of what it might have been in the past. Um, But the actual situation he's looking at, um, people not getting involved in things, I mean... Like, how many young people join political parties now? Um, And I'd say it's far fewer than in the past. There are members of trades unions, for example, read newspapers, um, you know, watch, you know, terrestrial television. I think a lot of markers of what you might call institutional belief and belonging and the signs and symptoms of that have gone down an awful lot in society, and religion is simply one more factor in that. But I think it's probably because we're seeing a kind of very strong rise in kind of individualism and a lack of institutional belonging in general. Okay, now, uh, Michael, I know that obviously as chair of Atheist Ireland, um, you will probably welcome the idea that more people are secular in their uh, outlook and thinking, But there is something about uh, religion, organised religion, that did bring an order to society that, you know, just may collapse. Well, I think that's a bit of an illusion. uh, And I I think it's a very significant statement by by the Archbishop to to recognise that uh, the visibility of the Catholic faith is vanishing in Ireland. And and it's part of a global thing. I mean, two thirds of Roman Catholics now live in the global south. It'll soon be three quarters. Uh, That's where the current Pope comes from. One of the first things that he did when he became Pope was to endorse an organisation of exorcists in the Vatican. So that's where the, the, the market for Catholicism is currently. But in terms of Ireland, its relationships with wider society are, are not, I, I think, as, as, as you suggest, positive. In general, secular countries have lower rates of uh, social outcomes like murder, juvenile and early adult mortality, STD infection rates, teen pregnancy, abortion and so on. And secularists have been shown to be typically less nationalistic, prejudiced, racist, dogmatic, ethnocentric, etc. But the most significant thing, I think, is that the implications for its relationship with the state, because the state gives real, gives privilege to religious beliefs over non-religious beliefs, uh, finances the evangelization of these beliefs by funding their own schools and hospitals and charities, uh, uh, in, including David's, and giving them privilege in things like solemnizing marriages. So that's going to have to end. The state has to give equal status to non-religious philosophical convictions such as atheism and secularism, and not give privilege to either and just treat everybody equally, regardless of their religious or non-religious beliefs. David? Well, I mean, there's plenty of solemnizers of marriage and so on, but not be religious. Uh, So there's been a big change in that regard. But um, Michael's point about secular societies are more peaceful and law-abiding. I mean, he's comparing essentially poor countries with rich countries and what and you can't make a comparison like that but you've got to look and do like you got to compare like with like so inside secular societies which section of the population is more likely to be law abiding um etc because obviously in poor countries um you're going to get more crime 
uh, policing is going to be less efficient. There's going to be fewer police. There's going to be more police corruption. I mean, that's a huge um, um, uh, function of poverty. So, again, we got to compare apples with apples here. Um, well, if you do that, David, and if you compare apples with apples, say, within the United States, you'll find that it is the Bible Belt states that have the higher incidence of those, those malign social outcomes. That's still a poverty it's, function. It's, it's the liberal uh, states on, 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 the, on the coast that have better social outcomes. That's a social class function as well, because a place like Massachusetts is much richer than Alabama. So again, you're not really comparing apples with apples. What you've got to do is you've got to drill down deeper and look at affluent middle class people who are, who are religious and not, and look at so poor people that who the, are religious and not. So religion can't affect that. So, so places no, no, where I'm not saying that. Is, as it's most powerful, which, which is, as you say, in, in, in the, it's in the global south, it's in Southeast Asia, it's in Central America, it's in Sub-Saharan Africa. Those are the places precisely where religion is at its strongest, because what religion preys on and to, to use the P-R-E-Y uh, verb, is is that, 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 that whole people focusing on survival values. And when people are focusing on survival values, they will find comfort in religion. And as people move away from survival values and towards self-expression values, then, then societies move away from religious values and towards secular rational values. So what you're saying is correct, but the implications for religion are not good. Well, I mean... Yeah, uh, uh, like what you're saying there is partly true, but I mean what what you're saying there is also um, uh, uh, a compliment to religion in some ways because obviously if you are living in very poor circumstances and religion gives you comfort, then that is an extremely good thing. But you see, like you've got to look at secular societies. Uh, secular societies take an awful lot of their religious foundations for granted. So, for example, there's a big debate taking place right now over. Uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan and they must abide by universal human rights. But where do universal human rights come from? They come from the idea that everybody is created morally equal. And in the Western world that can't be founded in secularism. I mean, you look at atheist philosophers like John Gray. They recognise perfectly well that if we are the accidental byproducts of evolution then we are not all created morally equal. Uh, you know, we're simply essentially organised atoms. So, where morality comes from is uh, evolutionary things like Empathy, compassion, reciprocity, cooperation. What about competition? Because competition is a huge part of our evolutionary background as well. Those are the things that 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 have evolved into expression in human rights. And what we're gradually doing in secular society is moving away from the idea that those rights are, are usurped by supposedly supernatural commands that that you should do something that is clearly Why not. Do you- Passionate, but simply because somebody wrote something in a book a couple of hundred thousand years ago and moving towards more recognition of individual rights and increasingly of the rights of non-human animals. And, and that is a positive thing. Societies, and, and societies with secularism, not with religion. David? So, yeah, societies organised on explicitly atheistic lines like the Soviet Union and China have hardly been models of human rights, have they? I mean... No, um, because, very because they're based on authoritarianism. Hang on, hang on, hang on, can I speak? Allow yeah. yeah. David yeah. just to, to, yeah. to explain his argument. Yeah, I mean, obviously, like the Soviet Union is the first society in history that actually organised itself on specifically atheistic lines and was anti-religion. Um, China under Mao and actually down at the present times, it's the same. North Korea, the same. These are not bastions of human rights whatsoever. And these are the only societies, by the way, in history that have organised themselves on specifically atheistic lines. And again, not bastions of human rights by any stretch. I mean, if you look at Europe, for example, after World War II, you had the rise of Christian democracy. And Christian democracy and its view of human rights heavily influenced UN human rights documents and also the European Convention on Human Rights. These have an extremely Christian bedrock, which any objective secularist is willing to uh, to acknowledge. I mean, the literature is absolutely full of the Christian democratic influence upon these documents. So basically, the kind of atheism and secular li- uh, liberalism you're talking about is trading on hundreds upon hundreds of years of, found- of moral foundations laid down by Christianity and by the belief that we are all created morally equal, which does not arise from atheism. And you talk about evolutionary morality. Yes, um, uh, humans do cooperate, but humans also compete because the law of competition is very much a part of evolution as well. And actually, if you look at human history, mm. competition and survival of the fittest and the powerful 
um, dominating the powerless, that's absolutely part of nature and the natural order. Yeah. And whereas but, but David, just, just intellect- before we g- give cre- Christianity the, the credit for uh, all of developed Western uh, thinking, um, sometimes it was do as I say rather than do as I do. You look at the Borgia Popes and you look at the Crusades where the human rights of uh, people of the Islamic faith were uh, certainly denied by the Crusaders. So Christianity has not been perfect in the implementation of the philosophy that you say it is the foundation of. No, that's absolutely 100% correct, because Christianity has often failed to abide by its own standards, because Christianity as an institution um, has often been about its own power and has often abused its own power. But actually, the history of the Church is in some ways um, a demonstration of the Christian view that sin is endemic in the world, is ineradicable, and we need a saviour. So that is kind of the Christian point of view, and unfortunately, to some extent, is proven by Christian history. But also, I mean, if you look around the world today, um, Catholic organisations run 5,000 hospitals, mainly in, the, mainly in developing countries. They run 16,000 health clinics. They run about 70,000 schools, often in very dangerous parts of the world. Uh, like, um, um, there was an elderly nun, and uh, I was trying to get her to give a talk quite recently to the Iona Institute. She couldn't. She was in South Sudan, where she was educating the next generation of nurses. And there was another group of Irish nuns, also retired, educating the next generation of teachers. And South Sudan is one of the most dangerous parts of the world. So the amount of good work these people do is absolutely enormous, and they've been mm. doing it for centuries. So, Michael, that is the question. Would secularists be bothered doing those kind of works which are inspired by people's uh, religious beliefs? Well, secular societies, and particularly if you look at the Scandinavian countries, have a very strong record in looking after the less privileged secular societies, uh, will will contribute more. I mean, do you see secularists heading off to South Sudan to do things, uh, the, the kind of work that is religiously inspired? Well, it's not religiously inspired. There are many charities uh, around the world that, 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 uh, are, that are not religious, that are secular based. And, and what, what the difference between them is, is religion, and this is something that the Catholic Church itself will say, religion says that, that charity has to be associated with evangelization. That's why they do it. They don't do it in, in order to, to uh, protect people on yes, the ground, they do. They do it in order to save people's souls. But that's not true. And, and it's, it's, not, it's not religion that causes those good things. It's activity. Activities and characteristics that can be associated with religion, such as that type of activity that you're talking about, such as social participation generally, such as a sense of meaning. But that's the case regardless of whether they're associated with religious or non-religious beliefs. David? And the history, does, the it history, adds in yeah. a corrupting element of saying that even if things are intuitively good and you can see that they have a positive impact, you should not do it because somebody says that the creator of the universe has told me I to think, tell you I to think, do it. I think, once again, Michael is taking too much of the Christian heritage for granted. I mean, what struck me when the uh, COVID outbreak happened in Wuhan last year, um, uh, I was reading you know, some of the background to this, the first hospital in the history of Wuhan, which is quite an old city, was founded by a Franciscan missionary in the 19th century. Much of the world, there was no hospitals whatsoever um, until Christians arrived. So we kind of think Christianity, sorry, that hospitals are something that will uh, arise naturally in all civilizations eventually, but actually it's not true. Hospitals were essentially uh, invented by Christianity, and the welfare state that Michael is talking about rests on Christian foundations. All the immense structures of charity set up by Christianity down the centuries, and then the the welfare state is an inheritance of that. It didn't come out of nowhere. It grew out of Christian roots, which is why the welfare state originated in the West. It grew out of a history where, as, as, as you've said yourself, where, where, where in developed countries or in developing countries, which is obviously where we all came from, ultimately, in developing countries which coincide with people relying on religion, these various things will, will evolve. But as they evolve, but why didn't they evolve in these other cultures? Survival values. They recognise that they don't need that, that, that false comfort of religion why in was... order to be kind, in order to be compassionate, in order to be just. And what we need to do now is, is the state state needs to stop funding these religious beliefs and the financial the evangelization of these religious beliefs 
and continue to provide the positive elements that you're talking about. And I would be just as opposed to the state promoting atheism as I am to the state promoting religion. And you're yeah. quite correct, David, yeah. that authoritarian secular states are just as bad as authoritarian religious states. All right. Last words to you, yeah. David. In it's terms, we need as a state it, yeah. that respects everybody on, equally. Uh, in terms of what gets funded, for example, schools, it depends on what the public wants. So if the public want Catholic and Christian schools, you know, up in a certain number, that should be provided. So I believe in responding to public demand. OK, uh, actually, I have a question for you, finally, from okay. Brian in Athlone. He says, uh, long before the arrival of Christianity, we had the Breton laws, far more socially liberal than the Catholic Church, and obviously trying to be just as well. Does David has, have an explanation for that? We had human sacrifice in Ireland back in Celtic times before Christianity <laughs> arrived, so I'm not quite so sure that's the way to go in. <laughs> All right. We will leave it there with uh, kudos to you both, because uh, that's from one of our listeners who says, an intelligent, respectful discussion. Welcome and so unusual.